Welcome to the Startup Grind. That's awesome. That's a very warm welcome. Well, welcome. Yeah. You green light over there? There we go. Mark check. The work? Yeah. yeah. All right, thanks. That was, that was awesome. I felt like Lady Gaga. <laughs> <laughs> you don't look like Lady Gaga. <laughs> um, we should. Have, we could have had you wear like one of your big hats. Yeah, we should have planned a little better. Uh, well, tell us, tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us, you know, where you grew up, um, and just tell us a little bit about, you know, your family and where you're from. Cool. Uh, my name is Justin. I grew up in Seattle, um, Capitol Hill. I don't know if any of you guys are in Seattle. Woo! Someone from Capitol Hill. Big yeah. Capitol Hill contingency. Right? Um, I've got a couple brothers. They work here in the city, actually, live here in the city. One of them was one of my co-founders of the exec. And I uh, came to San Francisco about seven years ago now, maybe, maybe eight years ago. And I've uh, been working at startups kind of since I had my whole professional career. I've had a lot of different you know, ups and downs and uh, kind of some wins and like lots of different losses. And so uh, happy to talk about all those things. I really like startups and I like technology and I, I think I'm really lucky to be able to do what I'm doing. You studied uh, physics and philosophy at Yale. Did you plan to be a physics philosopher? Or did you, what, what, what did you think you would do? I was just talking about this become? with someone at, at Yale. Yale has this thing, uh, it's called combined majors. It's like a hack. Basically, you get to take half the classes from each major and then you graduate. So you can cherry pick whichever ones you want, like all the easy ones, for example. <laughs> um, so I was gonna be a physics major and then I got to this one class that was like really difficult and I was like, I dropped out and I just said, okay, now I'm a physics and philosophy major. And uh, that's, that's how I graduated from Yale. <laughs> and so what, what were you gonna do? Were you always gonna be an entrepreneur or were you? Well, um, when I, when I was an undergrad, I mean, basically was like one of those students who was just like trying to do good by you know the kind of measure that society had or whatever. So I'd like try to get really good grades in high school, and then I got into I did all the extracurriculars and like debate team and stuff like that. And then I got into college, and I got into college, and I was like studying. And then I remember um, my junior year came along, and, and I was like, huh, I'm going to graduate pretty soon. I wonder what happens after that. Um, so I went to the career counselor. And I was like, well, what should I do when I graduate from school? Like, what are you supposed to do? And she was like, well, you get a job. <laughs> like, what do you like doing? And I was like, well, like, you know, I, I like all this, you know, I, I told her a bunch of things. And she was like, well, do you want to be a consultant or do you want to be like a banker? <laughs> <laughs> or do you want to go to law school? And so I like weighed those and I was like, okay, I want to, I think, law school. Um, so I took the LSAT and I didn't do very well and then I was like, okay, I need to figure something else out. And um, that's when I, I started working on this, well, this uh, calendar idea. It was like kind of like a, uh, well, Google Calendar wasn't out at the time, but we saw Gmail and we were like, we should make, someone should make a calendar like that, like a web-based modern calendar, kind of like Outlook on the web. And I started working on that uh, my senior year when I was like, I, I don't really want to get a job. And so, t tell us when you met your co-founder. When did you and Emmett first cross paths? Yeah, so Emmett was my first co-founder of, of Kiko, which is our calendar company, and, and we started. The, we knew met each other in second grade, and had kind of grown up in the same, uh, going to the same schools, and then uh, he ended up going to Yale, and so did I. And so we, um, he was the only guy who I knew at college who was like, uh, you know, a program. So I was thinking about like, now would be a good time to start a company, and, and so we were. I recruited Emmett because he actually knew a, like he had skills that could help create the company. I didn't. So at the time, you didn't program at all. You hadn't taken. You knew um, some basic HTML little, and some things. Yeah, like I, I like made a website before. Like yeah, a static website. Um, so I basically the first version of Kiko, which was like Google Calendar. Imagine Google Calendar, um, what it looks like today, except way better. That's like what we did. <laughs> and. Um, we have worked on, we basically <laughs> hacked the first version together by looking at like JavaScript tutorials. So I, I like didn't know anything about web programming. I didn't really know much about programming, period. And I was like, okay, how do you, you know, I want to create something that looks like Outlook where you can like click and drag, right? Like an appointment around. So I'd like Google like click and drag JavaScript. And then I'd copy and paste some code into my like really crappy 
know, basically single page calendar website, and um, eventually we had cobbled something together that like kind of functioned like a calendar. So you were doing this on your own, or Emmett was doing this with yeah, you? Yeah, Emmett and I were doing it, and uh, he was working on the back end though, and uh, we kind of I did the front end, and, and we collaborated, and I kind of learned, like taught me some things about programming. A lot of entrepreneurs in your position would have just said, I'm gonna go find somebody to build this for me, and make them some sort of partner, or something. But I'm not. I'm not going to get involved in it. That's not my skill set. I'm. I'm the philosophy. Yeah. Uh, philosophy uh, expert. Founder. Yeah. The philosophy expert. Um, what What drove you to step beyond that and to say, No, you know what? I'm. I'm going to get my hands dirty. I'm going to get in. I'm going to learn how to code. Well, we didn't really have any choice. Well, one, I didn't really even know you could contract other people to program things for you at that time. I like was really. Like didn't know anything. I didn't even know like there were web startups really. We were just like we could create this cool thing, and then maybe I remember our first business plan was like oh maybe Google or Microsoft would buy it. And that was like very in theory, and um, so we we uh, you know just started creating it. And I was like I don't know. I always I find the best way to do something is to try to break it down into as small pieces as possible, you know, as atomic pieces as possible, and just get started. And so. That's kind of what I did with um, with that. Start teaching myself like to program, you know, kind of step by step, and um, it never seemed like insurmountable. I guess. Tell us about how you got into one of the very earliest batches of Y Combinator. Uh, so we basically uh, had cobbled together this kind of calendar, and we, uh, you know, our, we were about to graduate, and, and uh, you know, senior was coming to a close, and, and so we said, well, what do we want to do with this thing? Um, and one of our friends had gotten this email from Paul Graham about this new idea he had, this new project called Y Combinator, where it was going to like fund some young people to do startups uh, over the summer. It was just like a summer program. So we were like, OK, let's try to do that. Um, so we applied to the first ever batch of Y Combinator. It was called the Summer Founders Program. Then it was like the first time. And uh, Paul wrote us back after we applied kind of did it last night, we wrote this application, it looked very similar to the application today, and we, Paul wrote us back a couple days later, like, there were three kinds of teams, you know, ones that we thought were really smart and had a good idea, and ones that we thought were bad and had a bad idea, and ones that we thought were, might be smart and have a bad idea, and you are in the group three. Um, <laughs> so he's like, would you come and interview and possibly do a different idea? And so we said, at that point, we were like, okay, sure. I don't even know what that means, but sure. Uh, so we, we went and took the train from New Haven up to Boston, to Cambridge. And we spent all night, I remember, in this motel, uh, hacking up, like making our demo actually function slightly better. Um, still pretty bad, but you know, you kind of get the idea of like drag and dropping things. And then we went and did an interview. And um, you know, a couple, like I guess that night, they called us back and said, okay, actually, you convinced us that your idea might not be terrible, so we'll let you in. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's that's basically what we what happened, how we got in. Well, so okay, so tell us about leading up to your launch, and then kind of that pivotal moment one month. Oh yeah, so the launch. so we basically uh, spent all this time building over the summer, and you know, we met the whole program. We spent all this time building, hacking away this calendar. It was, we we're in this really terrible apartment without air conditioning, it was in the summer of Boston, we called it Fort Dark because there was like no lights, um, and we'd just like sit here, like, in, I'd sit there in my underwear, sweating, like profusely programming, like cobbling together this like really terrible software. Like, well, I was really bad, like I'm kind of, kind of like a decent web programmer now, but like I was really a terrible, it was like all spaghetti code. And, but Emmett was a good No, he was like, he was like someone who thought he was a good programmer because he took CS, but he was actually like had no actual practical engineering experience, and he was also a bad programmer. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like the blind leading the blind. <laughs> so we, we put together this thing, and, and then eventually we, we launched it, a, a beta version, and it was really bad. But we were hired this designer who was really talented, his name was Rich White, he went to start on the start of this company called User Voice here in the city. Um, but he, you know, he joined us as our designer, and then February of the next year, we finally launched our version that we were proud of, and then a month later, Cool Calendar came out. It was pretty inevitable, actually. I think, you know, at the same time that we saw Gmail and thought there should be a calendar version of this, um, you know, so did a hundred other people in Silicon Valley. So there was literally like a calendar popping up, new web calendar, Ajaxified web calendar popping up like every month. 
from like from the time that we like got the Y Combinator through like Google Calendar coming out, and then they all like died, including us. Um, it turns out that uh, one of the things that I learned the hard way over the years is that you should really use your own product. And when I was a college student, I only had class Monday and Wednesday. They were at the same time every week. So when we were hacking up this calendar, it was like Monday what, class, Wednesday class. That's it. That's the only appointments I ever had on it. Uh, I wasn't really a power user, and I didn't understand like why someone like what features people need in the calendar. So we basically just spent a lot of time like cloning Outlook, and uh, we never really built something that we thought resonated, or, well, that really did resonate with with uh, you know any user base. So talk about that experience of you know, Google, one of the biggest and hottest technology companies in the world, basically launching your product, but not as cool and not as good as you said earlier, or, or maybe it was no, way it was better. better. It was better. It was way better. Um, <laughs> it was a lot better. So how did that feel? It felt bad. <laughs> it felt really, I mean, it feels terrible. Like, I was like, you know, I just, uh, I was like, we kind of should have thought that that was inevitable. And, um, you know, we didn't even talk to, to people like Google and, and Yahoo and some of the other big companies that had count, you know, kind of crappy web calendars or no web calendar but email. And, uh, you know, so we probably should have known, but we were like really naive in terms of both as programmers and, and also in business. So we kind of, you know, didn't really know what, what, what to expect. And then when this like, we had all, every time a competitor would come out, we felt really bad about it. And then eventually Google came out with a competitor and we were like, oh, this is terrible. Um, and you know, it worked pretty well. So uh, we eventually, we were very distractible that year. We kind of worked on all these different projects. Like it's been like a month after the Google calendar came out, we kind of worked on different projects. We built like an early version of uh, YouTube for audio. Remember, you know, kind of like SoundCloud. Never launched it. We built this like family social network. And we built like something that was like cloud hosts for MySpace. Because MySpace was really popular at the time. And we like never really got very far with any of these projects. But it was kind of like a web development boot camp for me and Emmett. You know, we like learned how to build products. Quickly, they weren't really good products. We didn't really talk to any potential users very much, but um, <laughs> we built a lot of things. Well, cloud for MySpace—that sounds like something like you'd hear about on the Silicon Valley HBO show or something. Yeah, I mean, it, it probably a dead pool. Yeah. Well, what talk, talk about that? How do you how do you now look at finding customer pain? You you built lots of products, um, but how do you understand? customers paying today when you start to build new products? Well, so basically when we started all these random things and with the calendar, our like feedbacks, like the customer feedback like iterative cycle was infinity long because we never talked to any customers. So that's bad, right? Like basically you're, what you need to do is shorten your feedback cycle. So the best thing is if you're really like your own customer, right? Because then you actually like build something, you're like using it, you're like this sucks, and then you change it to be how you want. Hopefully you're a representative of a non-trivial amount of people, like number of people, right? But uh, so solving your own problem is, is good uh, because it reduces your you know, the feedback cycle. Um, the other way, if they use it or pay for it, and find like getting them to try it when you have some crap, really crappy version and see if it like solves their problem, and then like relentlessly hound your customers to see if they actually like want to use it or not. And if you do that enough, you will actually have to build something that people want if you're like honest about it. Um, which, you know, some people are and some people aren't. And some people are to be, which I think we kind of put that latter category. How, how have you, like, talk about the specifics of testing that pain? Do you try to get people on Craigslist? Do you go to coffee shops? I mean, how, like, how have you actually found customers and physically gotten that product into people's hands that weren't your friends or your family? Uh, well, a lot of times it's just like emailing people who you think are in that group and uh, you know finding them on wherever you can. Friends of friends, LinkedIn, you know, uh, on emailing them from. I mean, so one example is with Twitch. You know, we there was already gaming video content being created on the web, and one thing my co-founder Emmett he really liked this content and he wanted to know why people were creating it on other sites. And so he just emailed them and set up all these conversations with, by Skype and asked them, why are you creating this content on other sites and not on Justin TV? And then from that, he took that feedback, you know, aggregated it, figured out what the common threads were, and then built the features that address that, and then went back a month later, or two weeks, or a month, or a 
week later and said, hey, we built this thing, now we'll use it. Some people said yes, some people said no, and then you take all the people who said no and do the same process again. And just, I mean, do that until we're like 45 million a month. So, it's worked. I'd say that's worked. Um, how, how do you know when you're onto a real monetizable pain and not just something that works for a couple of people? Well, uh, I think that's a little trickier. I think to determine whether you're actually on something that's like a really um, big pain point, it should be easy to sign people up, right? Like Optimizely has this great story that Optimizely founders about how they were talking about this idea, the idea for Optimizely with one of the, their one of their former bosses who worked on the Obama campaign. And they were describing the software like uh, that was optimizing, like you know, you could do this like visual, you could lay out and maybe test, and then. Um, someone you didn't have to have a programmer do it, and they were like, would you use that? And he was like, yes, like, I'll use it, I'll pay you right now, like, can I use it? And they were like, oh, we haven't built it yet, right? Like, so it should be really easy to sign up your potential customers if you're solving a big pain point. Um, you know, you might need to have the software, actually, but uh, what we found was once we built the right things, you know, for Twitch, it turned out to be higher quality video streams or, um, and, and a combination of higher quality video streams and. Uh, allowing people to make money off their streams and kind of support themselves by doing what they love. Once we had those things, you know, it became very easy to like find partners and have them join and, and, and use our service. Our hashtag is Startup Grind, and Justin is Justin J U S T I N K A N. All right. right. Um, so t tell us where the original idea for Justin TV came from. When did you start building that? Uh, so why? After we were sufficiently depressed with Kiko, uh, we were like, it was like 14 months in, we were like, this is terrible. Um, we had built all these other things and not launched them, and then we were like, okay, we need to do something, because we're running out of money, paying ourselves like $1,000 a month. Uh, you know, it was just like draining. Uh, so we got to be slightly less crappy web developers, but we were still like, didn't have a business. And so, we said, we need to get up, one, get out of Kiko, and then two, figure out something else to do. So to get out of Kiko, we were like, I had this idea of selling it on eBay. Uh, because we had seen, actually I had seen a, another company sell themselves on eBay, and it sold for like $100,000. That was like, it seemed like infinity to dollars I mean, so at the time. So I was like, okay, that'd be great. If we could only get $50,000 for our thing. Uh, so we ended up listing it on eBay, and um, I remember the last, the last time, uh, uh, I mean, sorry, but when the, the, like we didn't know if we were going to get any bids, and then kind of I talked to some people, like did, they were doing some diligence, and then the, the final day we kind of shot up from like you know we got a bid, and then we were really excited, and then it went up higher and higher and higher until it ended up at uh, two hundred fifty thousand dollars. So I was like, this is great. So we solved problem one. You know, we, we had so successful business. This model. was like in the last couple of minutes, right? Didn't it go up like a hundred thousand? Yeah, yeah, it shot up like a hundred thousand dollars in the last like ten minutes, and I was like ecstatic. I mean, this is. This uh, we thought we'd like permit Hit the lottery. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so um, what we did was see, after that we were like, okay, well maybe startups aren't so bad after all. You know, so, so I um, had this idea of, well, we had an idea for a business um, that was actually kind of like uh, taking your online content and laying it out into a book and then printing it for your, you know, like a coffee table book and you could sell them to your audience or something. Um, so we went to talk to PG about it, to Paul, and said, hey, you know, you have this online content, would you use this? And he was like, absolutely not. Like, I would never use that. What's the point of like printing out the content that's already easily available on the web? So he was like, what else do you have? Like, what other ideas do you have? And I, so I said, well, I have this idea for a reality TV show called Justin TV, where we broadcast ourselves, you know, kind of 24-7, <laughs> and, Brilliant. and he was like, that sounds interesting, tell me more about that. <laughs> um, so, you know, he was like, I was, was like, oh, maybe it's a new type of reality, like kind of entertainment, right? Um, so we, we ended up walking out of there with a check for $50,000. I remember one of his, one of the YC partners, Robert Morris, who's a famous computer science professor at MIT, said, um, you know, I'll fund that just to see you make a fool of yourself. <laughs> uh, so we, we ended up um, starting Justin TV because you know Paul kind of said it was like might be a thing, and uh, 
Turns out it wasn't the way thing, but we like got our you know our second start. And so this is you and Emmett again, and then Michael joins you. Yeah, so we right? recruited two other uh, co-founders for Justin TV. We one needed a, a co-founder to build. Like we had promised that we'd create this live streaming 24/7 anywhere we went, like show, but we didn't have any technical means to do it, nor any idea how to. So we emailed the MIT like EECS list and was like, "Can anyone build this?" And got two responses, and um, Kyle's was the best. So we kind of had recruited him, and, and he became our uh, third co-founder. And then. Um, my friend Michael was uh, coming off of a failed Senate campaign. He was the head fundraiser, and he did he did a good job, but unfortunately they they didn't win. And so he was looking for something to do, and I was like, "Well, you're good at stuff, so <laughs> why don't you come and be the producer of our show?" So he became the producer, and then later on our first CEO. And how, how did you? This is in 2006, 2007. Yeah, two, the end of 2006, and then early 2007. Yeah, and how 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 is this even? Technologically feasible. What were, how are you? That's a good question. Like uh, we, you know, we basically spent so cell phone networks were just coming out. Like you could get a DVD out card, just basically like a 3G card for your laptop, and like now you don't need that because you can just tether your phone, right? But like at the time they just, just rolled out DVD revision A, I think it was called, on like the Sprint network, and that was like a megabit per second up, and so we were like or it was between like 500K and a megabit per second. So we were like, what if we multiplex over a bunch of different EVDO cards from different networks, so we have all this coverage, and basically take video from this camera and encode it, and then send different parts of the stream through these different net internet connections, reassemble them on our server, and then send it out to the audience, you know, audience at large. Wow. Um, so we built that, actually, Kyle did, really. And, uh, he built this whole hardware setup. It was basically a computer, a Linux computer with a camera and with a video. Well, you're card. the star. You're not building this point. You're, I mean, you're. I was. Talent, I built right? a website actually. Okay. Okay. While we were getting ready to become, you know, I was I'm preparing mentally to become the talent. Um, <laughs> we built this. So we built. We built this whole thing, and then we were testing it, and it would, like it was buggy. It would like go down all the time. The batteries were like it was like 30 pounds of batteries. And, like, still Just happened. in a backpack. Yeah, it was terrible. And then a week before we launched the show, Trevor, who is a partner of Y Combinator, and he built, he's like a great hardware genius, he's built a walking robot, um, he's built his own Segway. He was like, why don't you guys just use a laptop? So we went to Best Buy, and we bought a laptop, like one of those small micro laptops or whatever. Um, we put a, one video card in it, and then we just streamed from that, and it like worked. <laughs> You're like, huh? <laughs> we should have thought of that like, seven months ago, <laughs> and we didn't even deep cut, but uh, <laughs> so uh, that's real cool. <laughs> so, so we ended up, uh, we launched the show the next week, and, and we, we, did wow. it, we did it with laptop, and uh, and it was just you, 24-7. Well, yeah, the other guys kind of did stuff, but they were like, they didn't want to be like on camera all the time. <laughs> After about 24 hours, neither did I, but you know, I kind of told everyone that I would do this, so we, we just... Uh, we started the show up and we were running, I was running around San Francisco trying to be entertaining and we got a bunch of feedback pretty quickly. It was like on a bunch of new media, it was on the MTV Today show and in the course of a month it like kind of, the idea of it is so crazy that it just like skyrocketed in the media, right? Like people wanted to write about Interesting this like story. crazy guy, yeah. yeah. And um, we got all these viewers and these viewers would come and then they'd write into us, write basically two things. One, Justin, you're like really boring, get off your computer and go do something to entertain us. And two, um, how do I create my own live video stream or something? So like this light bulb went off about a month in, and we were like, okay, like we could see retention was like not going up. Retention was like three minutes or something. People would like come and be like, this guy's like sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> what is the point of this? And then we, so we would. Uh, Are you filming everything, or was there some sort of? Yeah, it was basically everything. I mean, it was, yeah, it was, it was mostly everything. PG, but, I mean, PG-13, R? It was like PG-13, except for language, which is probably the R. And honestly, it would go down so often that it was really like 18 out of 24 hours or something. Yeah. <laughs> but um, basically, people, people now were like, oh, you had the idea to create a platform all along, right? And then you just did this as a stunt to like launch your platform. But we were, you know, the honest truth is that we weren't that smart. We actually did think we were entertaining enough to create this show. And we actually, you know, like we only later thought of the idea. Oh, light bulb went off. Like maybe we should just make it like YouTube and let anyone do whatever they want on it. So that's what we did. 
and the show had bootstrapped kind of a, the awareness about it a little bit. So when we did launch a platform, uh, which we kind of went back to the drawing board and spent all this time building, um, we had some initial content creators for it. So f fast forward a little bit, and um, you know, as entrepreneurs, we're always taught to focus, you know, religiously focus on what you're doing, keep the feature set low. Um, I'd love to know, you know, one thing that's very interesting about the Justin TV story is that you've you've got two startups that have kind of come out of it. One is Social Cam, and the other is which Justin TV morphed into, which is Twitch. But tell us what was happening at Justin TV. And what were you learning that made you all say, hey, you know what, we should shift our focus from what we're doing with Justin TV to these other things? Well, so what happened was like Justin TV, we opened up as a platform, people started using it, and it started growing. And like for the first time ever, we had talked to our customers. Basically, they had wrote us and said, we want to create our own live video. So we did that, and then we never talked to them again for like years. <laughs> but we talked to them, like, there was like a brief like aggregate, like one month where we like, received all this Illusion emails that all said, I want to create my own content. And so then we just like, heads yeah. down ran with that. Yeah, and every feature we built after that for the next three years was not used. Hmm. The only features that were used were video, chat, and like the infrastructure that went to scaling video so that like more and more people could use it. And luckily that was like good enough that like tons of people started using it. So it grew and grew and it got pretty big. And then eventually, it stopped growing because it turns out like live video is not something that everyone wants to do. You know, it's not. It's really only good for a couple of things, like things where like it really matters when it's live news, you know, sports events, like maybe some there was some like webcam like chats and stuff like that. With you know celebrities would do like webcam chats, but there were a lot of people you stream and live stream like competing for this like celebrity content or conference content. So uh, we weren't winning very many of those because we you know Justin TV was not very a very professional brand. Uh, you know, people knew it as this like guy who was like head came around. Uh, so it grew and then it stopped growing a couple years later. And we had spent all this time mostly building crappy features, like <coughs> this thing called challenges, where you could, everyone could like kind of request that someone do something, like, oh, I want to see guy, some guy do a skateboard trick. And then other people could I want to like, see someone punch Justin in the face. Well, hopefully they didn't request that. Okay. I think, actually think that was a challenge that was requested. Yeah. But it didn't get very many votes. Sorry about that. But um, people, people, we're gonna do it later tonight. I've, I've, I, I, <laughs> anyways, go ahead. It's coming. People could not. I'm, I'm on guard. Like, <laughs> who's gonna, yeah, who's gonna rush this thing? Yeah. Um, it's just how people get PTSD. <laughs> um, so, so we had this challenges thing, and um, we, we thought it was like a great idea for generating content ideas. Yeah. And then there was like no challenge. We launched it, and like zero challenges were ever. I think actually one, which was one that I did, which was like, so actually I think it was a skateboard trick or something. I didn't do it successfully, but like basically it was never used. We never talked to anyone about it. We like didn't know that like, we I don't know, we just didn't talk to any custom users of our live video service on like whether they would want this type of feature. And uh, then basically we did like, we built tons of things like that. We built like an API that people didn't want. We built this like Twitter live video thing that people didn't want. Um, things I'm sure I've forgotten by now. Uh, and then eventually we um, flatlined and we said, okay, we really need to think about what we can do with this. And so we looked at what people kind of were using and we thought it had potential. And uh, one of those things was gaming and one of those things was mobile. And uh, so we started, kind of broke off some teams and worked, started working on those, those things. You're an entrepreneur, you're creative, You've got tons of ideas. You never have enough time to build everything you're thinking about. How do you resist building features and creeping features into your product? How, how do you do that? Um, hmm. I don't know if I'm like the best example. I think that like <laughs> I, I do think I like love having new ideas and I love the idea of building new things. So like that, you know, I think that my co-founder Emmett is much more disciplined than that. And he really only focuses on the top one or two things at any given moment. And almost everyone else in the company is building infrastructure to support what already exists and what's already being used. And he's very good at weighing, you know, people like, like I always think of like the green 
field development as like, oh, you know, it has infinite potential. It can be like, it could you know, be even bigger than, you know, if we have 40, 47 million units today on Twitch, it could be like even bigger, twice that size or whatever. If we built this new feature. But Emmett's pretty good about being like realistic about assessing like, you know, where you can get actual gains. Like, oh, if we actually just improve our infrastructure, we can grow, you know, another 50% or even 100%. And even though that's boring, right, it's like what actually is going to work. Um, so, you know, I think that you should talk to your customers. You should only build something that more than one person wants, as indicated that they want, without you telling them first. Um, and I, I uh, think that's probably a good Well, story. it's interesting, too, even with challenges, it's kind of like Kiko, where it wasn't something even you guys would use. You used it once. Yeah, I know. I know. You would think if you'd spent all that time building it, you were going to be the most hardcore users of that thing feature. That. Yes. yes. So, uh, talk to us a little bit about Twitch and, and what's kind of happened with that. Um, you, Justin TV's kind of merged, kind of come into that, focus on gamers, focus on, I think you guys call it uh, ESPN for games, uh, which is a pretty good analogy. Uh, what, what was special about what you guys have done there? Because there's a lot of people that have done similar things. That have, I, I worked at Electronic Arts for four years, so I mean I've seen tons of companies try to do what you're trying to what you're doing and what's working for you, but it's not been successful for them. So what what made you all rise up above all these other competitors that probably had a much much bigger advantage over you to start with? Um, I think that so in the early days when we were figuring out, well, with Justin TV, what do we do? We had these ideas of like areas to work in basically. One was mobile, one was gaming, which became Twitch. And what we did was we set milestones on growth for each one that would make us feel like it was working. And we set those a priori, right, so that we wouldn't like go in hindsight and say like, oh, I think that's kind of working, or, I, or like it's not working, even though it's like, you know, kind of growing. Um, because we had had this problem like over time, like committing to something. So we, we kind of forced ourselves to say, These, if it grows like this, then we will actually commit to working on it for the long run. And um, Emmett, we, we set this goal of like 15% growth every month for Twitch, or for our gaming site, or section of, of Justin TV. And Emmett had you know, pitched gaming as a thing, and he, he liked the content, so he took a couple engineers and started working on it, um, and, and working against this goal, and it grew against that every month. And the thing that he did was really smart, and I think it was really two basic things. He empowered the community to, he like, well one, he got out of the community, he had, um, at Twitch, there's a, our COO of Justin TV, who's now the COO of Twitch, was um, liked the content, liked gaming content, and he was uh, he's like a great networker. And, and so he basically went out to all the gaming people and like was out in the community all the time, doing all the conferences, gaming conventions, and, and leagues and tournaments, and just talking to people and making friends with them and asking them what they wanted, how could we serve them better, and getting customer feedback effectively. And, and Emmett would parse that feedback and build the product and so, I mean it's really it's simple like it works like the video works it's high quality and we enable people to make a living on the platform and you know started off with just like one or two people making money in our partner program and uh, it's been two and a half years um, it's two, three years it's been three years and uh, now we have 6,500 people in the partner program um, you know I think it's over 100 are like full-time you know, content creators. So it's like, oh, you know, now we, we, we just have been doing more of what we started off doing in the beginning. But I really think it's that the really moment's focus on the community and then the quality of the, you know, that, of this, the service that's really made it take off. What, is, what does community mean to you? What it, well, I mean, the gaming community is actually like a really hardcore community. Like, they're, they're on Reddit, like they're on gaming forums, they're on Team Liquid, and they're like talking about what the upcoming events, they're talking about player streams, um, they are doing, you know, they're online all the time, um, they're sharing like this content. They're like hyper, you know, social media users basically. And so it really was like being engaged in that, like genuinely, not, not saying like, oh, I want to like be a part of the community and so I'll throw an event once in a while, but actually like we hired a great <coughs> network development team of people who are pro, you know, we're pro gamers or have been trying to make pro gaming happen for a long time or really just want to work in that industry. Like people like, you know, I'm sure that you at EA came across lots of people who 
wanted this to happen, right? And they would like spend their weekends and, and nights like on online playing games, watching video games, like going to tournaments. So we like went to those, we hired those people and they were like in the community asking, how can we make Twitch better for you all the time? Yeah, I remember, I mean, the first time it really occurred to me that this is something big is when Fatality was in, had like this huge feature in Time Magazine. Yeah. And this is like, 2000 or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, it, you just, it was shocking to me. It was like Bill Gates, you know, unveils, I don't know, it was Xbox 360, it was later than that, it was like around 2005. And then one of the big features was, you know, they're gaming celebrities and they are, you know, they're like the Kim Kardashians of the gaming world. I mean, that wasn't good at the time. Paris Hilton of the gaming world or whatever. Like but LeBron. The, what? LeBron of the gaming the world. The LeBron of the gaming world, yeah. And I saw this guy at E3 and, and there he is, you know, he's on screen and he's playing and it was just like, oh my gosh. Like, and he's got this huge crowd. It was just like, it was just like sports. Yeah. That's the type of content that's on Twitch. I mean, we yeah. do a lot of other things outside of esports, just, you know, media streams, communities streams like just pro players but um, you know people people like gaming you know gaming's big it's bigger than the movie industry yeah um, actually now it's much bigger it passed like in 2008 or something but now it's like much bigger than the movie industry it's you know every you know most guys who are under 30 grow up playing video games playing xbox and playstation and so it's it's a, it's a really big community of people who are gamers tell us about uh twitch plays pokemon what happened with that <laughs> Uh, well, Twitch plays Pokemon for people who don't know. It's basically someone, a developer, set up a stream on um, uh, Twitch that was a stream of the original Pokemon game on for Game Boy, and you could type in A, B, up, down, left, right, select, start into chat, and the game would execute it. It was in an emulator, right? So it would execute that command in the game. So it was like collaborative playing with Pokemon, and it just became this huge, I mean, talking about community, that became a huge community. There's like, there was a community on Reddit just for Twitch Plays Pokemon, where people would strategize how to beat the game because it was like almost random. Like people would like be typing A just for the hell of it. And there was, there was too many commands to be actually processed. So, um, you know, at times there would be, you know, we got up to over 120,000 concurrent people typing in commands. I think at peak we had more messages than WhatsApp being processed in that channel. Wow. Um, just like, but this is not the way that you intended the platform. No, this is just, you know, this is kind of the consequence of having a platform, right? People make it their own and they figure out ways to make, make interesting um, content on it and like make interesting experiences. And so, um, you know, it was covered very broadly and I think a lot brought awareness to a lot of new people about Twitch. And, and um, that was earlier this year and then it spun off this whole category. Now you can go on Twitch and see like all these Twitch plays games of like people playing various, um, uh, you know, games collaboratively, basically. And uh, it was interesting, it was, it was, it was pretty interesting. It, something that's really unique about you is that your timing is really impeccable. And, you know, a lot of people have good timing once, and then some people have good timing a couple of times, and you, you seem to continually have good timing with the products that you choose to work on. And i give you a couple of examples. Social Cam, <coughs> Uh, at one point in a weekend gets 4 million users it's like blowing up like it's Instagram for video based with Instagram yeah. with video am I saying that right? it's like video, video Instagram video basically. Instagram thank yeah. you and uh, your competitor raises at a 300 million dollar valuation you were the maybe the leader in the space you all sell it uh, to Autodesk for 60 million dollars which was kind of seemed kind of crazy but then Actually, the timing was perfect. You sold Exec to HandyBook, uh, which just this past month raised another round, a $30 million round. And this was a very crowded space, competitive space, and you you kind of leveraged this good idea and jumped, jumped in with, with another ship. Um, you know, you sold Kiko on eBay for $250,000, which I think a lot of people in here can really relate to that experience of, feeling like, hey, I've got nothing, and I've just sold it for what feels like the most money in the world. And I don't know what ended up happening with that, but I haven't ever used Kiko. So I'm, I'm just wondering, how, how do you know when to start building the right product, and how do you know when to either get out of that product or to move on? What, what, how do you think through 
the timing piece of moving in and out of products and ideas? Well, I actually think that the best entrepreneurs have like a little bit more um, attention span, I kind of have a little bit of ADD of ideas. So I think in some ways that's been good, and some some ways that's that's been not as good. Um, luckily, I have Emmett, who's the CEO of Twitch, um, kind of running Twitch, and he's like he's really been the one to propel that and like stick with it and um, leaving me free to like do different things. Um, but like you know, with Social Cam, one of the things that we learned was you know at that time we had spun it off. We basically incubated Justin TV and had worked on it, and then spun it off. And my co-founder um, was running it with two engineers that. Um, from Just TV, and so they became like new co-founders of, of uh, Social Camp, and it was a new corporate entity we had created. And um, he had their hard work, due to their hard work, really, it was like blowing up. Um, and I had a call, I was talking to him on the phone, and he was like, well, what should we do? We talk, talking about what to do, and uh, I mean, basically I was like, well, it's their retention, right? In order for something to have longevity, it has to be for retention, and it wasn't like very clear if there was retention or not, so I think it was a lot easier to say, hey, maybe we should, you know, if you have that exit opportunity, it's like not a bad idea to take it. You know, it's something where like a lot of people, I don't think honestly assess what's like going on in their company, and I've definitely been guilty of not doing that at times. And like, um, you know, even just but just looking at the metrics made us a lot more comfortable doing it. Um, but exact, uh, you know, I think that the space was growing, um, but it was also growing more crowded. So I was a cleaning company, kind of like online to offline, Uber for cleaning. And um, I, I think that the, the, the truth was that it was like, while it was growing, um, it wasn't something that I was like super passionate about. I realized that I created something that people liked. You're not stoked about cleaning? Uh, it's just that like, it, it's more of an operational company. And that, like, most, it's not about necessarily new technology. It was mostly about like logistics and operations. And while we were doing some things that I think were innovative, um, it wasn't something that I like, every day I woke up and I was like, ah, I've got to be there. Um, so. You know what it made sense was to like join someone else, you know, and invest. Like I believe the space is growing, and I think that you know it's being borne out right now in the venture markets. Like you can see, like lots of investment in the space. People are interested in it. Lots of consumers using it, um, and so you know it made sense to like take equity in another company and and um, kind of join forces with someone else, um, and then it left me to kind of do do other things. Um, so I, I don't know if there's a like timing secret. I just think it's about thinking about, I'm always thinking like, what do I want to be doing, I guess, and trying to accommodate that. You hear a lot of entrepreneurs talk about, you know, this is this is the last company I'm going to build. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, uh, <laughs> for which one? All of them. <laughs> uh, Bing Gordon has called, you know, has said to entrepreneurs, you need to build an internet treasure. Yeah. And my question for you is, are you building products to sell, or are you building is that just the result of what happens? Is it? Are you building with the intent of, hey, I am going to do this for a really long time, or I am going to add value to this for a really long time, or is it, hey, I'm going to I'm going to put something into this, I'm going to create a, equity, and then I'm going to move on to the next thing. Well, I think the thing is like you always want to build something that has value. That's like the the best thing, whether you want to sell it or build it for a long time. Um, I think generally you are less capable of, or people are less, but do uh, like build things less well if they are trying to build it to sell. Like we've never built something because we thought, oh, we could sell this to someone. Um, it was more we built it because we thought people would use it. And then uh, we've been the most strategic about like, is this a thing that like will have long, you know, will be lasting for these like kind of uh, strategic reasons, you know? But honestly I don't think very many entrepreneurs are. I think they just build something that I think people will use and then for the lucky few that that is the case for you know them. A lot some of them turn out to be them. like uh, some things with legs and some of them don't. Um, you know, I think that like every time I've started a new idea, it's like the best thing ever. And I always approach it as like this is like the great my greatest idea ever. And so, uh, I, I well, that's how all, all ideas are until you give it to customers. Yeah, exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Nothing, you know, it, it, when before it's reached customers, you know, it could be it's, it exists entirely in your mind. I told someone the other day that. He was afraid to launch his product, an entrepreneur, and, and I said, well, you know, you should launch it because, and he was like, why, why should I launch it right now? I'm like, well, right now you like live in this, the fantasy that it like is going to be successful, but like as soon as you launch it, you might like have the reality that it's like not going to be successful, and you need to like face up to that as soon as possible, you know? 
Um, and I think that like I've always approached things as like this is this is a great idea. I want like this could be my like you know best company ever, biggest company. And um, sometimes that's you know happens. Sometimes it doesn't. Is it so? I'm assuming you're not a believer in going stealth. Yeah, I, I, I used to actually when I when we were working at Kiko. I remember I was talking to you about the idea for a job. I had a job interview I had with a um, consulting company firm or whatever because I was trying to line up some backup options. And uh, I was afraid to tell them about Kiko. So I kind of like beat around the bush about the idea. But what I real, I've realized over the years is like the probability that someone is going to like quit their job and like go and take your idea and like do what you, you know, your idea and like drop everything else. It's like that's like very, very low. I've only heard of that happening like three times maybe. <laughs> But it seems like a lot, but like, you know, out of all the ideas and like times I've talked about hundreds, about thousands, yeah, probably a thousand, you know, times of uh, ideas I've talked to with, with various entrepreneurs. Like, but know, those three were really great ideas, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, well, one was uh, my I'm being friend. sarcastic. Well, I mean, we always think that, right? Like, this idea is amazing. Like, yeah. I, I can't, like, I mean, I have, a, I mean, Zuckerberg said that one time about Facebook. Like, this is probably the best idea I'll ever have. Well, that might have been the best idea. It's true. It was true. <laughs> Uh, uh, Winklevoss said the same thing. Um, so, uh, but you know, how do we get over that? How do you how do you step out? How do you you know what what do you do to get over that fear? Well, I mean, I just think like let's like you should be realistic. Like the idea, odds that someone like people have jobs and they have their own startup that they're do, you know working on, or they have their own job or their investor and their jobs investing, and like they're not like out there like trying to steal your idea and then like give up everything they're doing to just like pursue that. Like that's very there's a diminishingly small amount like probability that's gonna happen and the benefit you get from discussing your idea with other people, um, especially here in the Silicon Valley where people are like trying to help like willing to help you, willing to talk to you, um, you know, help you with referrals to like people you can work with or you know might be investing in, in tech companies, it's like there's like this massive amount of benefit and very, very small risk. And yeah. you know, even if they do steal your idea, like they're not the one who's passionate about it necessarily. So like, you know, usually they're not going to win, I don't think, um, in the market. Um, so I don't know. I, for me, I've never really been a fan of like, you know, doing things in stealth mode. Also, like around here, like just turns people off and you're like, oh, I. This idea, but I'm not going to tell you what it you is. You need to sign this first. Actually, I did. I did. Um, I met one one set of founders. I mean, I, I knew them, uh, but I remember talking to them, and they wouldn't tell me what their idea was. And um, it turned out to be a multi-billion-dollar company. So, like, maybe, maybe just, it can work. It can work. Uh, there's no. There's no like. What I've learned is there's no like set way to start a startup, right? If like Dr. Dre can start a startup and dividend it out himself, like nine figures, and then like sell for like billions of dollars. Like any, you know, there's lots of different ways to like start startups. Great insight. Um, so Twitch was recently rumored uh, to be selling to YouTube for a billion dollars uh, or somewhere in that range. Uh, I don't know if, you, if there's some big exclusive coming tonight or not, but <laughs> no, I can't comment on it. But if Google knocked on your door, let's just say hypothetically, uh, <laughs> I mean, Google knocks on your front door. You have to open that door and listen, right? I mean, that's a that's a conversation. If if if, if, a, if a company like that comes and says, "Hey, we're interested in your startup, you're focused, you're building," but that's a conversation people have to have, right? I think at the level that Twitch is at, uh, Twitch, you know, so we reach 45 million people every month. Uh, we have a million broadcasters every month. Um, you know, we're the fourth biggest. Uh, Peak bandwidth user in North America, and we're also the wow. biggest streaming site now in North America. And at that level, like we talk to everybody. You know, we're talking to everybody about how we can work together. We're, we're partnered with Microsoft and Sony. We're on the Xbox 360 and, and uh, on the PlayStation 4. So, you know, we literally talk like anyone who has like people on the internet. You know, we're always talking about how to work together um, with them. So, you know, those conversations go all, all sorts of ways. Just one more hypothetical. If you sold a company for a billion dollars, what would be the first thing you would buy? Uh, you know, I, 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 um, I haven't like really. There's nothing I want that I like don't have. Um, 
I, uh, I just, I, I, you know, like most of the things that I want to do are capable, you, know, you can accomplish with a computer and, um, you know, your ID. And so, like, I don't, I don't necessarily, you know, I, I don't have a lot of, like, expenses. Um, so I, there's nothing that I really want. You know, I run a motorcycle, which is a very cheap vehicle uh, to have. So, yeah, there's nothing, there's, I haven't really, there's nothing on the list. Do you think, um, you know, that if you start another company, would you consider bootstrapping it, or would you, I mean, you, you would have enough money to start your own company, to run your own thing. Would what? you consider doing that, or would you automatically go raise money on it? You know, I, I think that there's pros and cons to both approaches. Like, I, I um, have no plans to start another company right now. I, I actually really enjoy working at White Comedy. Uh, which is, you know, a lot of great partners, and it's very interesting to me because it suits my personality. I get to work with like uh, a bunch of different companies and help like work on you know many different projects, and I feel like I get to do something new every day. Um, and the operational, you know, execution and, and pinging of starting a startup is, um, you know, really falls on the founders. So great, you know, kind of best of both worlds. I can help, but um, someone else is really making it. You know, they're they're really doing. Everything and deserve all the credit. Um, in terms of starting another startup, I think that like regarding you know, I've talked to a lot of friends of mine who've like been successful about like whether they bootstrap or raise money. I think that there's you know, raising money from other people is can be a pain in the ass, uh, but it's good to get other people engaged in the process of you know, getting, creating your company because your angel investors can help you hire and uh, promote promote your product, be your first customers, um, and it's. You know, it's also someone to hold you accountable. Like if you raise, you know, venture funding that you're accountable to a board, um, that's going to push you to like make something great. And I think that it actually is valuable to be accountable. You know, sometimes being able to just do whatever you want uh, means you can, you know, kind of be allowed to fail. Hmm. So I don't know. On the other hand, I don't really like being accountable. <laughs> <laughs> So when your life, and we're going to take questions in just a minute, and you can just come right over here to this mic uh, if you want to line up for those. When your life and career are over, what is the one thing that you hope people say about you at your funeral? Well, I guess that, I hope that, I mean, I guess there's two things. Like, one thing I hope is that people think that I like Helped other people along. Um, a lot of people helped me in starting Justin TV and our other startups, and I couldn't have done it without my co-founders. Actually, you know, maybe it's more like they couldn't have done it without me, but like because they're really the ones carrying a lot of the companies. Um, but we could have done it without each other, and we could have done it without like a greater network in Silicon Valley that's like really helped us along, like Paul and our early angel investors in the company um, and our early employees. And so I, I really like to spend time, I mean, part of why I like YC is like I, I get to give back. I feel, I feel like I get to help younger entrepreneurs and, you know, grow their companies and, and um, learn, you know, harder lessons about startups. And uh, that's something I really like doing. Um, so I hope they think that I was like, people think I was, you know, helpful to them in uh, becoming successful, you know. The other thing is like, I really just like doing a lot of things. And I have a lot of interest. It's kind of like so. I hope people think that like, well, like I was like interesting, and he did a lot of interesting things. You know, in the past year, I, I like startups, but I'm also like learning fabrication skills, and I'm building a art piece out in Oakland. I was out there welding just before now. Um, I've been in the past couple years. I've been growing my own liquor, and actually, that's illegal in California. So I, I mean, yeah, when you were in Seattle, yeah, when I was out of state. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> just been doing a lot of different different stuff, and I always like new new things, you know, like new challenges. And so I think that you know that's one thing I I hope people like think I did some interesting shit, like like Kanye or whatever. I you know I've got a dope life and I do dope shit. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, let's give Justin a big round of applause.